Hello, Cobra Law fans. Race Judicata here, formerly of the law firm Sui Sponte, now with the law firm Cobra Law. Do you love Cobra Law? Have you been victimized by G.I. Joe fans making fun of Cobra Law? Have you been hurt in the posterior regions every time someone says Cobra Law is stupid? Well, Cobra Law is on the case. Cobra Law has decided to no longer attempt to take over the world using seed spores and instead attempt to conquer the world using lawsuits. We sued this hooded Cobra Commander 788, poof, if that is his real name, for his unfair hatred of Cobra Law. We sued him so hard his head spun. I'm happy to announce Mr. Hoodie Coco will be opening up his forum to everyone who wants to talk about Cobra Law. He asked you to send in video clips about it. I'll bet there are a lot of people out there who love Cobra Law. In addition to that, Mr. Kevin from SEO Toy Review, a noted Cobra Law lover, will be handling the media segment of this review. If you love Cobra Law, there's no need to thank us. You're welcome. We at Cobra Law work every day for mutant world domination. Eventually, you will be assimilated, but in the meantime, enjoy the review. Cobra la 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 Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here. This is the show where we review every vintage G.I. Joe toy from 1982 to 1994. And this one is a redo. I did a review of Cobra Law before, and I was not very nice. I was so harsh, in fact, that I took that video down. Fans of Cobra Law have for years been urging me to take another look at them. Well, you got your wish. And be careful what you wish for. For me, Cobra Law was the end of G.I. Joe. I was so disgusted by the 1987 movie, I lost interest in the toys. Cobra Law was so uncool and ridiculous that if that's what G.I. Joe had become, I couldn't see myself as a G.I. Joe fan anymore. Obviously, I got over that because I'm a G.I. Joe fan now. But what it means is I can't be unbiased about Cobra Law any more than I can be unbiased about anything else I've already experienced. I don't think it's my job as a reviewer to be unbiased, but it is my job to be fair. And I think I can be fair even about things I don't like. Thanks to Brandon Knight for providing a good set of these figures and their accessories so I can do this review properly. I invited your Cobra Convergence 5 presenters to share their thoughts on Cobra Law, but I didn't think that was enough. I wanted to hear from everyone. I invited all viewers to send me clips sharing their thoughts on this controversial set. If you sent in a clip, you will see it in this video. Thank you for helping out. HCC 788 and you present Cobra Law. This is the Cobra Law team. Ooh. Come on, Bri, you can do this. Deep breaths. It's like Lamaze. <laughs> All right, well, let's give it another try. Here we go. This is the Cobra Law team. They were introduced in 1987 and were also available in 1988. They were discontinued for 1989. There were no other versions of these figures in the vintage era. After they ran their course, they were forgotten. After all, according to the movie in which they appeared, all of these characters are dead. This Cobra Law 3-pack included Golobulus, the Royal Guard, and Nemesis Enforcer. All three figures were sold in a single pack. They were not available separately. This isn't the only time a 3-pack was available related to that 1987 animated movie. Sergeant Slaughter's Renegades were also released in a 3-pack. 
they had the virtue of still being alive at the end of the movie. I'll have to mention the 1987 animated movie a lot in this review. I won't go into detail. I've already done a full review on it. Instead, I asked Kevin from SEO Toy Review to talk about the movie in the media segment of this review. He actually likes the movie, so he's more qualified than I am. Some collectors have speculated that the 1988 Iron Grenadiers nullifier may have originally been intended as a Cobra Law figure, but was repurposed as the AGP driver. The seed for the creation of Cobra Law came from the advertising agency Griffin Bacall. Joe Bacall wanted to go in a sci-fi direction for the 1987 animated movie, and Cobra Law was the result. The backstory and specifics were hammered out by animated series writer and story director Buzz Dixon. He was tasked with creating a Cobra Emperor to replace Cobra Commander. He came up with two ideas. One, Serpentor would come from a shadowy organization somewhere called Cobra Law. He would be sent to replace Cobra Commander because of the Commander's consistent failure to take over the world. Or two, Serpentor would be created from scratch by Destro and Dr. Mindbender. Unfortunately, Sunbow Productions liked both ideas, and Buzz had to figure out a way to make them both work. The suits made these decisions, and the creatives had to work it out. The name Cobra Law was supposed to be a placeholder name until something better could be chosen. The name is an allusion to Shangri-La from the 1933 James Hilton novel Lost Horizon. Unfortunately, that name stuck and was used in the final draft. There are a lot of fans of Cobra Law. Some people became G.I. Joe fans because of the animated movie and love Cobra Law. There are a lot of folks who don't like Cobra Law, though, including the people behind the creation and development of G.I. Joe. Buzz Dixon has talked about his shock at the directive to create this thing and the disappointment that it derailed some plans for the animated series. He tried to convince Hasbro not to do it. Larry Hama, the writer of the comic book series, flatly refused to include Cobra Law in the comic book. Kirk Bozigian, a Hasbro executive at the time, said the creative team did disliked the idea. That doesn't mean you have to dislike the idea, it just means the people who were forced to work on it didn't like it. It was not a labor of love. In the movie, Cobra Law had a battle cry. It went something like this. Cobra la 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 Let's take a look at the card back, and I have the full card back, thanks to Brandon Knight. And it is huge. It held three packaged figures. There's a G.I. Joe logo on the top and a Cobra the Enemy logo here, which is sort of true based on the movie. It says Cobra Law Team. Here it says fully posable modern army figures, and that it definitely is not. The artwork is okay without being exceptional. There are some mountains in the background, which I guess is supposed to represent the Himalayas. You can see where the figures are packaged. Nemesis Enforcer was here, Royal Guard was here, and Golobulus took up all this space. There is a list of contents, and I will talk about this when I discuss some of the accessories. Flipping the card around to the back, we have some more artwork, and this artwork is way worse than the front of the card. They are out of proportion. The heads are too big for the bodies. There's this blurb that explains what Cobra Law is. I won't read the whole thing, but I'll give you some highlights. First, Golobulus is a biomechanical creature, and Cobra Law is a colony based solely on living organisms and hypergenetic manipulation. Cobra Law lives in an ice dome deep in the Himalayas, and they believe that the human technology based on inorganic lifeless substances is a trap to their culture. So that's the premise of Cobra Law. Cobra Law is a culture based on organic technology, and they consider technology based on inorganic matter to be a travesty. But that's shown to be BS right away, because even these figures come with some inorganic technology. And in the movie in which they appear, they use a piece of inorganic technology to carry out their nefarious scheme. There are three file cards on here. We will take a closer look at all of those later in this video. This set was worth three flag points, as it should be, since it was a three-figure set. 
There's a cross cell for Sergeant Slaughter's Renegades, and this example still has some birthday wrapping paper still stuck to it. Let's look at these figures individually, and I'm going to start at the bottom of the totem pole with Royal Guard and work my way up. This is the Royal Guard. This was an army builder. In the movie, there were many Royal Guards, so you would want to buy multiples of this figure in order to build an army. But it was only available in the three-pack. The only way to build an army of royal guards was to also build an army of Golobuluses and Nemesis enforcers. Nemesis is... Nemesis I. Nemesis What? What's the plural on that? Let's take a look at royal guards' accessories, starting with his battle axe. The battle axe is a wicked shape. It looks really cool. It's in silver plastic. It has lots of nicks and scrapes on it. Looks like it's been used many times. This kind of looks like a Klingon weapon. It is silver to look metallic, and this kind of looks like inorganic technology to me. This does not look like biotech. His next accessory is his pistol. The pistol is in gray plastic. It is pretty plain and unexceptional. Uh, this definitely does not look like biotechnology. This definitely is inorganic technology, which again is contradictory to the premise of Cobra Law. The final accessory is the antenna. The antenna is detachable. It is removable. It connects to the side of the head. There's a hole on the antenna that connects to a peg on the side of the head. The antenna itself is small, it is red, it is made of flexible plastic, so it does bend very well, but it does not stay on the figure very well at all. You can peg it on, but it will fall off very easily, and this is a frequently missing part. Let's take a look at the sculpt design and color of Royal Guard, starting with his head, and on his head he has a bug-like helmet or face. I don't know if this is his real face or if it's a helmet. He's got big blue bug eyes and a gray snout. Uh, the top of his head is red, and he's got some tan, sort of organic splotches on his head. His chest features a dark gray base uniform with a tall collar that goes all the way around. He also has some red shoulder pads that reach up pretty high. That kind of makes his shoulders look a bit low. He has a red chest plate with organic shapes and texture on it. On the back, he also has a back plate with similar organic texture. On his arms, he has red upper arms and tan rings around his biceps and gray elbows. The gray is a different color than the gray on the chest. In fact, all of the gray on the lower half of the figure is a lighter gray than the gray on the head and the chest, and I think that's an unfortunate choice. It would have helped the figure to look more consistent if they had kept the same gray throughout. He has red forearms with elbow guards, and those elbow guards are really wide. To me, they look like the arms of a chair. And then he has gray gloves. On his waist, he has a gray belt that's the lighter gray color and there's no way this is organic technology that looks like a belt he could have picked up at jc penny he has a bit of that red armor directly under the belt and on the hips he has some ridge details that continue down to the legs the legs feature gray trousers in that lighter gray color according to the premise of cobra law these pants must be alive in some way the ridge detail continues on the outside of the legs and then on the front of the thigh there are these organic tan shapes with some texture on them. He has some red boots with some additional texture on them. On this particular example, there's a hole in the leg. On the lower leg, on the right side, there's a hole in the molding and this does not appear to be damage that happened uh, after the figure was manufactured. That is not something that is on every Royal Guard figure. This appears to be a factory error. I believe this is what's called a short pour. That's when not enough plastic gets into the mold and you're left with um, an unfinished piece. The overall look at this figure is insectoid. This is fine for an army builder. The forearm guards are my least favorite parts. It looks like he sat on a chair and there was super glue on the arms of the chair and when he stood up the arms of the chair went with him. 
It doesn't look like armor to me, it looks like furniture. This is Nemesis Enforcer. In the movie, this character was big and menacing. The figure is of average height though, so he is much less intimidating. Let's look at Nemesis Enforcer's accessories. He came with bat wings that attach to the figure with a peg, like a backpack. They are in gray plastic. It's a soft, rubbery plastic, so you can flap the wings like a bat. It has finger and vein and hair detail. It's well sculpted, but they are very undersized, way smaller than depicted in the animation and even smaller than depicted on the artwork on the card. Just much too small for this figure. I'd say these wings are comically small. They are totally inadequate. These wings should be at least twice the size, if not larger. His final accessory is this back attachment with tentacles. It has eight tentacles, four on each side. It has molded in details, like sucker details, similar to an octopus. It also fits on a figure with a peg, like a backpack. In the movie, Nemesis Enforcer did not have tentacles, but he did have a tentacle weapon. In the movie, the tentacle weapon was used to attack Sergeant Slaughter, and you can kind of do that with the toy by putting the peg in Sergeant Slaughter's back and then just kind of wrapping him up in the tentacles, but unfortunately with the toy, when you let go, the tentacles sort of spring back out. Besides which, that's not how the tentacle weapon worked in the movie. It was more of a face hugger that attached itself to to Sergeant Slaughter's head, but the toy doesn't work that way at all. Let's take a look at the sculpt, design, and color of Nemesis Enforcer, starting with his head. On his head, he has a purple helmet with a texture pattern. That helmet has a nose guard that runs right between his eyes. It also has his ears exposed. He has white eyes, which is kind of creepy. Not exactly scary, though. On his chest, he has a purple uniform with a texture pattern. Now, this uniform, I could believe, is alive. It has, like, a, an animal skin texture on it. It has texture, but not a lot of detail. He has a red harness that goes around his back and over and under his arms, and it clasps in the front with this silver emblem in the center. On his arms, he has unpainted painted shoulder guards with that texture pattern that look like they should be painted purple, but they are not. They are just flesh tone, and this is bad. This is a glaring unpainted detail, and in my opinion, this is not an unpainted detail that can be overlooked. He has bare arms down to his gloves. He has silver spikes on his elbows, and these spikes should be much larger, according to the animation. These spikes are small and disappointing. He has purple gloves with some devices molded on them. These arms are incredibly disappointing. On his waist, he has a red belt, more of that purple textured plastic. And on the front, he has a red crotch guard under a big tan W. Under this big W. You can't miss it. A big, a big W. On his legs, he has that purple textured plastic. There are tan straps around his thighs and tan holsters on the outside legs on both sides. At least they look like holsters. They don't hold anything. He has red patches on his upper and lower legs that meet at his knees. Those are not knee pads. The lower legs are otherwise in that purple textured plastic. He doesn't have defined boots. More like his purple uniform just covers his feet. This figure has a lot of wasted potential. It's missing paint applications. It's too short. The arm blades are too small. The wings are way too small. This figure needed to rival Sergeant Slaughter, but it doesn't even come close. Nemesis Enforcer was revisited in the modern era. He got a modern action figure. It was in a comic two-pack that also included Lieutenant Falcon, which is a pretty good figure. The modern Nemesis Enforcer figure was renamed Nemesis Immortal, and it's a decided improvement on the first version. This Nemesis Immortal figure is taller than even the average 4-inch modern action figure, so he has the size to be intimidating. Those wings are much larger than the version 1 figure, perhaps not quite as large as in the animation, but still much, much better, a huge improvement, and those spikes on the arms, again, 
again, much larger, much more intimidating. One downside of this figure, the wings are so large, it makes him top heavy and he wants to fall backwards. So in order for him to stand, he has to be hunched over a bit. The figure was in a comic two pack, as I mentioned, and it came with this comic book. So he did make it into the comic after all, just not the regular series. Uh, this is a story with Lieutenant Falcon, Lieutenant Falcon versus Nemesis Immortal, showdown at the top of the world. And this is reasonably well written and drawn. This is Golombulus, and this one is a doozy. This is the figure that always gets a big reaction. Whenever I show it to non-G.I. Joe fans, they always think of something obscene. In the movie, Golobulus was voiced by legendary actor Burgess Meredith. I covered that at length in my review of the movie. There's no way to avoid looking at this. He has a big long snake tail. So let's do it. Golobulus came with only one accessory, what the card contents call his laser gun. It is in red plastic. It's intended to be slung under the forearm like this. That's not the best way to shoot a gun because you can't look down the barrel to aim. You have to shoot from the hip, which is not very accurate. The accessory itself is well sculpted with lots of organic looking details. But it looks like it has a video game joystick on the top and a magazine on the bottom. That magazine looks like it could come from you know, Colt Firearms or Smith & Wesson. Uh, maybe they have a retail presence at Cobra Law. You never know. Let's take a look at the sculpt design and color on Golobulus, starting with his head. And my god, that's an ugly head. But that's okay, it's supposed to be. Mission accomplished. He has a bald head with veins. He has a device that goes around his head and covers his right eye. He has a big, black, gross left eye. And the rest of his head looks pretty human. Perhaps he was once a man. On his chest, he has red crustacean-like body armor that covers his chest and back, but leaves his left shoulder and his midsection exposed. That red crustacean armor even has crab legs sculpted onto the chest. This armor, not only is it indestructible, also tastes great with lemon and butter. On his right arm, he has a couple red armor plates on his upper arm, but it has his bicep exposed and the red paint does not go all the way up the shoulder. So it looks like he has armor pieces just stuck onto his arm. His right arm is mostly bare, but it has some extra vein sculpting on it that looks great grotesque. His hands are bare and he has a red armor on his forearm with some kind of device molded on. His left arm is totally bare but the arm is green with red veins all the way down the arm and all around. Ew, gross. According to the artwork, there's supposed to be claws on that left hand, but it's just a regular C-shaped hand on the figure. I guess they hadn't quite gotten away from that standard buck for the hands. Finally, we can get to the snake tail. The lower half of his body is a snake tail. It is in green. It's a lighter shade of green than the left arm. The front has a texture on it that looks like snake skin. The back has a ridge pattern. It is segmented, apparently to make it easier to bend, but it doesn't help that much. This is a bendy tail. It has a wire that runs down the inside, and you're supposed to be able to bend this into any shape you want. The problem is it isn't bendy enough for you to form it into a coil for him to stand up or to coil it around his enemies because it just doesn't bend enough it doesn't stay what that means for Golobulus is he can't stand up on his own to keep him upright you have to lean him against something or he has to just lie down the catalog photo had a different tail I don't know if it's an improvement. I don't think it's possible to make half snake guy here look good. This, in my opinion, is a terrible action figure. Because the tail won't bend in a way that will allow Golobulus to stand, there's no way to keep him upright. He must either lie on the ground or lean against a wall, and neither option is very fun. He can't effectively use it against his enemies either, so the tail is just a nuisance. I've always been curious about the construction of this figure, given the very non-standard lower half half. So I'm going to use my old crappy Golobulus and I'm going to take him apart and look at his innards. He has a screw in the back like a standard action figure so I'm assuming we can take him apart just by unscrewing that. Uh, he feels like he has an o-ring but what exactly is that o-ring attached to? All right looks like he is splitting apart. There we go. 
There we go. Oh, man, this one's all cracked and broken. Oh, all right, check this out. He doesn't have an O-ring at all. Um, well, all right, I'm not going to be able to get this one back together. He's all busted. But look, there's no O-ring. There's just a post, a rubbery post that simulates the movement of an O-ring figure. But there's no O-ring on this guy. So um, he just, uh, his torso just wraps around that post. And the post will bend a bit. So that's fine. Interesting way to construct that uh, without any extra parts and without the standard J-hook and without an O-ring. It may seem strange to say that a pack of three figures did not have enough figures, but there's an omission here. There's a missing figure for Cobra Law. That is, of course, Pythona, a female Cobra Law character that was prominent in the movie and important to the story. There was no vintage Pythona figure. There was a modern figure from the G.I. Joe Collectors Club figure subscription service. That figure was was reviewed by Timmer on his YouTube show Half the Battle. I didn't review that. That was reviewed by the ghost of a future version of myself that I killed in 2012 and you know what? Doesn't matter. Pythona! I really really like this figure. It looks absolutely fantastic and it's a damn shame that it took decades for this character to get an action figure. And of course you could then only get it through the collector's club. So it's rare, expensive, and kind of worth it. The only thing I don't like is that the hair on top of the figure is just plugged in, not glued in, so it comes off really easy. Yeah, cause that's what G.I. Joe collectors really need. More small stuff you can lose. Especially when it comes to rare figures. Still, it's a pretty awesome figure. I'm just sad that not a lot of people get to enjoy it. Thank you, Timmer. Please make sure you check out Timmer's YouTube channel and subscribe as he's trying to reach 2,020 subscribers in 2020. Let's take a look at the file cards that are printed on the back of this giant card back. There are three file cards. Let's start with the bottom and work our way up. This file card for the Royal Guard has their faction as Cobra, which is not exactly true, but close enough. There's a portrait of the Royal Guard here, codename Royal Guard. He's on the Cobra Law team. This top paragraph says, Bred and surgically enhanced for size, strength, and endurance, the Royal Guards of Cobra Law are responsible for the personal protection of Galobulus, supreme leader of the Hidden Valley and last descendant of the Serpent Kings. Encased from head to foot in organic insectoid armor, Cobra Law are impervious to any ordnance up to high explosive anti-tank round. Although formidable in battle, the guards tend to be tactically unimaginative and are relatively useless without close supervision. Bred and surgically enhanced for size, strength, and endurance, and yet the figure is average size. This is a problem I have with Nemesis Enforcer as well. These guys are supposed to be big and intimidating, and they are not. This bottom paragraph says, there was an attempted coup in Cobra Law about the time when Emperor Hadrian was building his wall. 500 irate noblemen stormed the inner sanctum of Galobulus's summer palace and were confronted by just 20 guards. Galobulus slept through the entire incident. One guard was slightly wounded. Of the 500 noblemen, there were no survivors. This bottom paragraph does a great job of describing the royal guard as badasses, but the figure just doesn't live up to it. Next up is Nemesis Enforcer. Once again, a cobra is the faction. A portrait of Nemesis Enforcer here. Codename is Nemesis enforcer he is on the cobra law team this paragraph says they say in cobra law that Galobulus raised the nemesis enforcer from a pile of dead things and that where his soul should be there is nothing but emptiness his leathern wings have beat across the night sky since before the ice age as he tirelessly carried out the dark will of his master and creator Fleeting glimpses of his sinister form gave rise to legends of vampires, harpies, and countless other things that go bump in the night. He is the reason we have vampire legends? Not with those little wings. This bottom paragraph says, He can glide silently and land without a sound. He is the other presence in the pitch black room. He is the lurker in the dark just outside your bedroom window. He rattles the garbage cans and makes your floors creak. He is the dread that stands behind you in the dark and dares you to turn and face him. So he's kind of an asshole. 
Stop rattling those garbage cans. It's the middle of the night. I'm trying to sleep. Finally, we get to the file card for the headman himself. The faction is Cobra. Again, not really true. According to the movie, Cobra is more of a faction of Cobra Law than the other way around. Portrait of Golobulus here, codename Golobulus. He is the Cobra Law ruler. This top paragraph says, Descended from the serpent kings of prehistory, Golobulus rules over Cobra Law, a hidden secret valley in the Himalayas where the high priests of the biomechanical cult have created created a technology based solely on living organisms. The buildings of Cobra Law are really colonies of crustaceans, and the clothes of inhabitants are as alive as the people who wear them. Golobulus has achieved immortality through symbiosis, at the cost of his humanity. But he never was human, according to the storyline, unless he was once a man. This bottom paragraph says, the plates of Golobulus's body armor are living mutations of lobsters and crabs, each genetically altered to perform a specific function and bred for the tensile strength of their chitinous shells. Over the centuries, so much of Golobulus's body parts have been replaced or biomechanically altered that very little of the original is left except for his brain and his central nervous system. If these guys are so great, why did they need Cobra Commander? Why did they send out an incompetent leader to conquer the world using the inorganic technology they hate so much? On the one hand, the 1987 Cobra Law team is a really well done three pack of action figures. But on the other hand, I'm just glad that Hasbro didn't stick with this monster theme and return to traditional Cobra bad guys for the following year. Rather unfortunate because these guys would have blended right in with the visionaries or have been a perfect foil for the Inhumanoids. As far as I can recall, the Inhumanoids actually do have a sort of a HP Lovecraft sort of elder horror kind of backstory. And that goes really well with the origins printed for the Cobra Law team. Thank you, FormBX257. It's always great to have you in my videos. Now I turn it over to the other Kevin from SEO Toy Review to cover the media section of this review, which consists of one thing, the 1987 G.I. Joe animated movie. Hey, Hoodie, thanks for having me. Kevin from SEO Toy Review here. In the mid 80s, after Kenner's success with Star Wars, and Mattel's hit with Masters of the Universe, Hasbro's Transformers and G.I. Joe boy action lines were at the peak of their popularity. Hasbro had, had great success marketing some of their lines to kids with syndicated cartoon shows, and they decided to release theatrical movies of G.I. Joe, Transformers, and My Little Pony. These movies would usher in new toys as important characters in the cartoon show, and therefore promote sales of the new action figure lineup. Hasbro worked with Sunbow Productions, Marvel Productions, and Toei Animation for these animated movies, just like they did with the syndicated cartoons. The quality of the animation on the movies was much higher. Because these companies were still working on the syndicated shows at the same time as the movies, there was a lot of complications and crunches that resulted in a delay in G.I. Joe the Movie. G.I. Joe the Movie was meant to be the first of the toy-related movies to be released, and unfortunately became the last. Due to Hasbro losing about $10 million because of low box office numbers on Transformers and My Little Pony, and backlash from parents after the death of Optimus Prime, G.I. Joe, the movie was released on home video. Plus, with a little bit of additional dialogue, Duke managed to survive taking a stake through the heart. Go figure. During the 80s, Griffin Bacall Advertising was a huge partner with Hasbro in making the G.I. Joe and Transformers a huge success. The ad agency was responsible for the G.I. Joe comic book commercials, which allowed Hasbro to use more animation in advertising than they were allowed if directly advertising the toy line. It was Joe Bacall who insisted on the G.I. Joe movie taking a more sci-fi tone. He insisted that you can't market an hour and a half long war movie to kids and teens. While the movie was meant to promote new toys Hasbro had designed, some additional characters were created to fit the direction and tone of the movie. Two multi-packs were released as a direct tie-in to the film. The Sergeant Slaughter's Renegades and Cobra Law 3-pack were based on the film, but don't make any mention of checking out the G.I. Joe movie in theaters or on home video on the package. The Cobra Law 3-pack included Galobulus, a half-snake man in crab shell armor who wanted to use G.I. Joe tech to incubate spores in space to mutate mankind. His bat-winged thug, Nemesis Enforcer, and one of his elite troopers from the film, the Royal Guard. While the art design and animation work on these characters is pretty impressive in the film, the action figures fall a little short. In the film, Galobulus floats around in a giant tentacle sphere for most of the film. 
I think the reveal of his giant snake tail might have been really neat, but this was spoiled for me by seeing the action figure. Nemesis Enforcer was a hulking brute with massive wings in the film. He lifts a running vehicle, cuts open the bottom with his elbow spikes, and rips out a terrified snow job in his first fight. Later on, he takes down three of the best Joes, Alpine, Gung Ho, and Bazooka. And the only Joe who can physically go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this guy was Sergeant Slaughter. The Royal Guards are numerous, unstoppable, insect warriors who attack from below the ice with quick reflexes, flashy weapons, cool capes, and a whirling dervish la -la 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 battle cry. As a kid, I loved G.I. Joe the movie. The animation looked phenomenal. The scope of the battles incorporated nearly every character. The voice acting from the original cast as well as the new celebrity voice actors was wonderful. And the stakes for the Joes had never been higher. This G.I. Joe adventure wasn't the first to involve sci-fi elements or even monsters, but it did retcon the origin of Cobra Commander, and I think that's the movie's greatest crime. For many years after the G.I. Joe cartoon show was off the air, the only way I could relive the excitement of the G.I. Joe cartoon series was to re-watch a copy of the movie I had taped off TV. For me, it never gets old. I know the plot's pretty absurd, but I never cared. The opening battle around the Statue of Liberty is my favorite piece of animation ever created. Pythona infiltrating the Terradrome is amazing. The scene of my favorite G.I. Joe beachhead breaking in the new recruits is classic. And who would have thought a roadblock Cobra Commander team-up travel movie would have worked, but it does. And anytime I look at the clock at work during my middle school class and see there's only five more minutes till lunch, I think of Falcon being interrogated by Serpentor. All I gotta do is hold out for five more minutes. I don't know what else to say. It's nostalgia, but I love this movie. Looking at Cobra Law overall, I don't like these figures. I don't like them at all. From start to finish, I dislike them. Do they have some good qualities? Sure. Royal Guard has lots of paint applications. It looks like a lot of effort went into that figure, but the bug eyes and the snout look kind of silly. Those guys are supposed to be big and intimidating, but the figure just isn't. Also, they're supposed to be troop builders, but you couldn't build an army of royal guards without building an army of Galobuluses. Nemesis Enforcer should be a big, menacing figure, but it isn't. He should be at least as big as Sergeant Slaughter, yet he's smaller. The light purple is a weak color, and the texture pattern is used as a substitute for detail. It's nice, but it's not detail, and it's a poor substitute for it as well. The Royal Guard must have got most of the paint budget, because Nemesis Enforcer has some glaring paint omissions. The wings are way too small, and the tentacles are just... there. This is the figure that needed to sell the set. Nemesis Enforcer in the movie was a badass. He went up against Sergeant Slaughter. The figure needed to measure up, but it doesn't. Corners were cut, and it shows. Globulus has a big snake tail. It bends, but not enough to be useful. It looks silly at best, and obscene at worst. The sculpting on the upper half of the figure is actually fine. It matches the description on the file card. It is ugly and monstrous. There's no getting past the tail. Cobra Law was the end of G.I. Joe for me as a child. Despite this, I'm trying to be fair. My old review was criticized as being unfair. Well, here you go. I've looked at all the details, all the accessories, all the merits and flaws. I still think they're terrible. They are a festering boil on a baboon's backside. They are a foul-smelling discharge from a donkey's afterbirth. They are the action figure equivalent of vomiting on an empty stomach. They are weak old garbage burning on a hot plate. They are not very good. My opinion has not changed. I don't like them any more now than I did the first time around. But my opinion is not the only one out there. That's why I invited everyone to share their views on Cobra Law. I wanted to hear from you, especially if you liked the toys. If you don't like my opinion, perhaps you will prefer the opinions of your fellow G.I. Joe fans. Hi, I'm uh, Dave, and this is Shane from uh, Ontario, Canada. And uh, HCC has asked everybody if, uh, if we like Cobra Law. No. Why? Uh, well, they turned Cobra Commander into a snake.
Yeah, and uh, before that, G.I. Joe was all this awesome stuff. And, uh... Hello, my fellow Bartokis, MC, DJ, PC, PC. On the topic of... Pro-Wall, Arlen and Jordan, Chief and Joe, or Miss and Jeffrey. Which I never played originally, I thought it was should be part of the three pack in my opinion. Then I should be the three pack of the guards. However, there was no build up in the cartoon TV movie, which just should have been, and of course there was really no let down per se afterwards. And of course, no Cobra Law vehicle, which is really bad to me. Really, by the way, I like them. I think they could get a lot more of the story. Hey, it's Greg from Anything Joe's. The thing that I like most about Cobra Law is that it took the notion of what a G.I. Joe universe was supposed to look like and threw it out the window. So while you may not like this bizarre fantasy universe, it spoke to the imagination of young children and said, hey, you know that crazy idea that you've got running around in your imagination? That absolutely has a place in G.I. Joe. Embrace that idea, nourish it, and run with it. Hey, everybody. West Prophet here, AKA Joe Hunter 73. I'm gonna let my figures do the toughen on what I think about Cobra Law. I'm a deep inside target hunting. So, Joe Hunter 73 wants us to express our opinion on the Cobra Law three figure pack. I despise of them. Destro? Your thoughts. <laughs> For once, I agree with you, Cobra Commander. And I have a solution to exterminate them once and for all. Uh, do tell, Destro. <laughs> this shall do the job. Like the little grubs they are, Cobra Commander. <laughs> splendid, Destro, splendid. We shall pollinate the world now and get rid of Cobra La once and for all. Cobra! Happy Cobra Convergence from Joe Hunter 73. Get ready for Paul from G.I. Joe Bergs. 30 seconds of Cobra, la 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 and let's go. Love the Royal Guard, love the detail, love the sculpt, check that weapon, so cool. Love his head sculpt, dig that green arm, such awesome detail, snake tail. Nemesis Enforcer, cool detail, hate this gun, hate that green thing, these wings suck, you're gonna need one of these. This is G.I. Gary from Pina Comics, and my opinion of the Cobra Law set is that this Golobulus's tail ruins an otherwise decent subset, and even the Renegade subset, because of this total tie into the movie that I personally enjoy and have fond memories of. This belongs as a pen, not as an action figure. Give this guy a wheelchair or legs. I first saw G.I. Joe the movie in 1988, or was it 1989? I saw it, I saw it on TV, and I wasn't able to start the show. Um, the first scene I saw was Lady J being pulled up by that weird, weird, weird plant. And then it kind of creeped me out. It even creeped me out more when I saw those giant insects. Yeah. But I like Cobra Law. Cobra Law! Really, I get up this morning, and what do I see? Cobra Law. Cobra Law! Cody! You... Uh, you know that's a sore topic for me. I mean, I was my son! Um, uh, Cobra HR is gonna hear about this! When I was younger, I was scared of Cobra Law, but growing up, they're actually pretty silly. 
because outdoor grounded reality in the comic books. But now it's just important, so it's pretty cool. And now you know, and knowing half the battle. Hello, viewers of HCC788. I, for a moment, want to talk about Cobra Law. Cobra Law is weird. Just the overall concept of Cobra Law is weird. Buzz Dixon and Hasbro of 1987? I think you guys made a big mistake. And you thought Serpentor's ridicule? Cobra Law is the defining factor of ridicule. Why? As a kid, I didn't hate Cobra Law. But I wasn't really impressed with them either. I just saw him as a new villain for the Joes to fight. Really didn't blow my skirt up, but didn't ruffle my panties either. But looking back as an adult, they really don't fit with G.I. Joe's mythology, and the toys themselves don't fit with the toy line. Now, I think the toys themselves are fine. They're just not G.I. Joe. I didn't have them growing up, but I think if I did, I would have been more inclined to put Globulus in the back of my KO Cruiser than in the back of my His Tank. Greetings, fellow Cobras to the final episode of Cobra's Convergence 5. Today we are honoring the great toy line, Cobra Law. These are my favorite figures growing up because I'm a huge fan of science fiction and fantasy. And with G.I. Joe, that's an automatic win for me. So let's shout out for Cobra Law. Cobra Law! Cobra Law is definitely part of my collection for G.I. Joe. Um, I don't have a problem with them. I get why other people do. Um, if you're super into the comics and you were that was your first introduction to them, I totally get why you don't like them. I was born in 83 and the cartoon was all I knew about really. And I like the idea of Cobra Commander coming from a secret underground serpent society instead of being a used car salesman. So they work for me. I like Cobra Law because they're cool Lovecraftian style monsters. And you know, Galobulus is voiced by Burgess Meredith, the best penguin. And that's really it. I mean, I know they're not really military, but they're still kind of cool. Cobra. La 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 is actually kind of terrible. Um, pretty easy to bookmark that as the place where G.I. Joe took a little too hard of a dive into science fiction fantasy, um, just as a concept. And uh, the toys were just awful. Uh, I mean, Globulus couldn't even stand. Uh, Nemesis had the little itty bitty tiny wings. It just wasn't very good. Hey guys, Brad from Cast Eyes here. And I have to say that sadly, I am not a fan of Cobra Law. The giant bat wings, the super bright colors, the insectoid helmets, the serpentine tails were a massive departure from the near future modern 80s aesthetic that had been part and parcel of the G.I. Joe brand from the early comics. They just never appealed to me. Sadly, this feels more like Masters of the Universe to me than G.I. Joe. And for me, it has just never felt right. That's right. Always wear the safety equipment. All of you, safety first. Cones, I like to see those out. Good, good. Hoodie! Yes! Cobra Convergence 5! And you want my opinion of Cobra Law. Mm. How can I say this? It sucked! It was the worst thing ever! You're gonna reduce me down to saying, oh, I was once a man! I mean, come on! I'm going to be bossed around by this? This? This isn't even a proper action figure! Look! It looks like a damn anal bead or something! Hello, Hooded Cobra Commander. This is Esteban from Costa Rica. And uh, yeah, I always thought it was very cool, uh, this three pack, the Cobra La. Um, I saw it when I was a child in stores and never got the chance to own it back then. Um, but I thought it was very interesting, like how they looked like a very alien-like, especially the one with the long tail. I, I don't memorize the names of them, but uh, I always thought they were pretty cool. So cool, man. What's up, guys? It's Jonathan from Glitch Matrix, and I love Cobra Law. I don't know what it was, but from the very beginning in the 80s, the whole idea of this secret civilization hidden somewhere in the Himalayas just tickled my imagination. And then the first time I saw the three-pack of James Way with Galobulus, the Royal Guard, and Nemesis Enforcer, 
I was hooked. I mean, just, just look at this thing. The sheer audacity, the sheer ridiculousness that Hasbro actually had the gumption to make a dude articulated like a G.I. Joe, but half his body is a snake. They made a snake man. Globulus, I can't quit you. That was our review of Cobra Law. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks to the Cobra Convergence 5 presenters you saw in this video. And thanks to everyone who sent in a clip. Today for Cobra Convergence 5, you will get content from Joe Colton Cosplay. And that will conclude Cobra Convergence for this year. There will be a wrap-up video tomorrow, as well as the final fan participation video. It's been a lot of fun this year. I hope you enjoyed watching. We will be back next year, and I promise it will be even bigger. As for me, you can find me on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, and I have a website, hcc788.com. I also have Patreon if you'd like to support the channel in that way. You can get some perks, such as a code book to decode the secret messages in these videos. Patreon really does help keep this channel going, especially now. So if you'd like to support the channel in that way, I would greatly appreciate it. I'll be taking next week off, as I always do after Cobra Convergence. After that, it'll be time to get back. Back to G.I. Joe. For the time being, though, remember, only Cobra is Cobra. Let me see.